comes from uh, one of my favorite quotes. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Albert Einstein, um, you might think that he was into complexity, but he wasn't. Um, he was looking for the simplest uh, solution. And he classically said everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that is the challenge. Because uh, even if you look back at your old code, you realize, oh, but I can, I can simplify this. And sometimes it's good to go and look at how other people simplified uh, their work. So, talking about persistence, what is persistence? Here's some nice definitions. The act of persisting, uh, the quality or state of being persistent, uh, especially perseverance. We would like our data to persevere, uh, at least beyond uh, um, a dip in electricity. Um, the quality that allows someone to continue doing something or trying to do something, even though it is difficult or opposed by other people. That is something you have to do in IT every day. And it doesn't have to do much with spring data, but it talks about perseverance. And then the state or of occurring or existing beyond the usual expected or normal time. So persistence is about putting data somewhere so that we can get to it later. And traditionally, we've been using a small set of technologies and that space is growing. And that brings us to the word polyglot. You may have heard it, you may not. Um, there are cases when they just use polyglot and it refers to a program or script written in a valid form of multiple programming languages. And I'm going to show you some an interesting example. But for me, it's used more often in the term knowing or working with multiple languages. And as you just saw, you are going to be faced with other languages like Scala or like Groovy or maybe Ruby, all living in the same JVM. Now here's an example of a polyglot. So this is a piece of code that is valid PHP, it's a valid C program, and it's a valid sh uh, shell script that all do the same thing. I do not advise you to try and deliver this uh, to your paying customer, um, but it's an interesting exercise. So. What is going on in persistence? Uh, most of you um, may have worked with a traditional relational database. MySQL, or Oracle, or DB2, or Microsoft SQL Server, um, or Postgres, one of my favorite um, SQL servers. And um, you can get a lot done. But they are limited. And they don't always scale to the internet. Because if you are doing a system even for a large organization, maybe you have 20,000 users. No, that's not internet scale. Internet scale is millions of users and billions of transactions. And then your traditional relational databases um, don't cope 
Or maybe they do, but it costs an enormous amount of money. So the solution is to find a database that focuses on that specific problem. And there's a whole explosion in databases that are tailored to addressing specific problems in specific ways. Um, as an example, MongoDB and CouchDB are both document databases. So you can describe your data as a JSON uh, uh, document and you can store it and they can index elements of that uh, document for you and you can retrieve it uh, very efficiently. And it is a nice way to store customer data. If you want to store financial transactions, um, especially if you want to operate on them afterwards, and RDBM is still the best way to do that, then you get databases like Elasticsearch, Solar, Cassandra, HBase. Those are good for audit trails and analytics and search. And um, they can scale to huge volumes. They can cluster um, over a lot of machines. And they are very good for putting data in and then later searching it. But they are not good for manipulating the data after you put it in. If you want a different version of the data, you change it and you put it in again under a different name. Redis and Gemfire are databases that are specialized for um, shared state. So um, you want to, um, an example, uh, you're building a game engine and you want to track what's happening in the game in real time, the events change various aspects of the state and it has to push that information out to all the players. Redis is a fantastic database for that use case because it internally supports a publish and subscribe mechanism. It internally has support for all kinds of data structures and you can directly provide operations that says, well, take this thing and change its state in that way. You're not loading an object, making the change to one element and <coughs> putting back the whole object. Leo for, for J, uh, Orient DB are graph databases. And those are good for um, social data. So you want to find out how all these things are connected and you want to walk this graph. So if, if you've got a, all the people in the world and all their family histories and you've got somebody and you want to answer the question, well, this guy, give me a list of all his cousins. So what is a cousin? No, that is um, a male child of his parents' siblings. What is a sibling? A sibling is a... Um, somebody that shares the same parent. So um, you can add those rules and the graph database is the most efficient way to extract that type of, of information. They often combine graph databases and um, semantic databases, but there are databases that are specifically called RDF stores. RDF is the resource description framework that they use to classify and store semantic data. You basically store the data in what they call a triple. And a triple is in essence, what's the type of data and what is the element of in that type and what is the value, that's all. And they go in, in, a, in one big row and some of them are related and some of them are linked and internally it actually builds a graph representation of this huge amount of semantic data and you then have a language that you can use to navigate uh, the semantic data. 
Hadoop, you may have heard of it. Who's heard of Hadoop? Yes, it is a, a tool that was built after Google published some papers on the work that they built and, and on how to do search. So now people use Hadoop to manage large amounts of data in batches and essentially managing MapReduce jobs. MapReduce is a, a, a description for um, mapping some fields and combining them to eventually um, uh, form new views. So that allows you to do grouping and all kinds of, 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 of things to your data by applying a simple set of, um, of rules. But if you want to do it over huge sets, you can't do it in a JDBC query, manipulate the data and put it back. And something's going to break because you've got billions of records. So let's now start looking at some examples. You may um, uh, be able to read this. It's a simple JDBC example that shows some code that may have been written uh, 10 or even 20 years ago. So there's a simple uh, method that's going to accept the connection because the connection is owned somewhere else and it is creating a prepared statement and that should be familiar uh, SQL and what we are doing here is we are trying to find a person uh, with a user ID and we are selecting the user ID and the email and the name. We are retrieving the data and we are creating a person object and we're putting them in a, um, oh, hmm, I don't have a result allocated. Um, I am returning the first person that I find there. The only reason I put it in an if is because you have to ask the next uh, to get the first element. Then here's an example of an update. I'm saying I want to update uh, the person and I'm updating all the fields where that's the user ID. And that's a type of code that would have been written. And if you did it well, you put that code in a data access component or a data access object and when there was a model change, you had to go back and uh, change these objects. <coughs> this is an example of something you may or may not have encountered. It was built early on, I think, came out with Java 1.2 or 1.3, something called SQLJ. This allowed you to embed SQL into your Java code and the SQLJ compiler would take your code and now add stuff to make this happen. So it added code that basically did a similar uh, piece of work to our previous one. But this is an equivalent example but with the caveat the syntax may be incorrect because I couldn't find a JVM that still had SQLJ. Okay, so if you see this, delete it. <laughs> now, we move to an example of a different kind of technology. Let's say you now want to write some Mongo code. So if you use the Mongo APIs, you are working with a DB collection. Find a person means I want to operate on that um, collection, but my query is a document with these values. I get back documents and I have to find stuff out of the document and <coughs> build up an object. So that's the thing I'm working with. I'm working with this, this JSON document. And if I want to update him, I um, create a document. This one represents the key. Uh, I add all the other attributes and now I create a new document for the query and I say I want to set that and now I'm doing an update 
which is a document and the query is a document. So it's more difficult to read than the previous code and it tries to achieve the same type of thing. So what is this talk about? This talk is about improving programmer productivity, doing polyglot persistence in one language, like Java, not having to learn um, all the details of MongoDB, for example. And that language is Spring Data. So how does it achieve this? Spring in general, I believe, is about programmer productivity. Because Spring in itself, Spring doesn't give you an object relational mapping. Spring gives you a way to improve the way you use Hibernate or JPA. Spring gives you a way to improve the way uh, you work in an EJB container with um, remote EJBs or with message queues or sending a mail. So it's about programmer productivity. Some of you, um, before I go much further, who has had um, experience working with Spring on a, on a project? Okay, in the last year, some. So lots of people worked with it some time ago and they may have had a, um, a bad experience or a good experience or they're not lucky enough to work with it anymore. But at its base, it's a container that provides what they call inversion of control or <coughs> dependency injection. So the container has a graph of objects. Uh, some of them are named and uh, some of them are singletons. Some of them are just factories. And you can ask this container for an object by name or by type and you can then operate on that. And that container is created based on a configuration. And in a sense, uh, that can be incredibly powerful, but you have to understand the upside and the downside. Spring provides what they call a template for JMS, JDBC, Hibernate, JPA, MongoDB, and much more. And these templates are wrappers around the native APIs that make it easier to work with them. Now, Spring Data takes all of this and adds a new layer on top. And that new layer is similar to what you would have coded by hand as a data access object or data access component. So how often do you make simple mistakes when you write code to use the JPA Entity Manager or with Hibernate? There are mistakes you can make that you want to reduce. There are things you don't need to do because they're just boilerplate. If you are not looking at JPA and you're looking at Mongo or other databases, each one has their own API. So now if you want to have an application that stores its customer database and customer data in, for example, Mongo, and the financial transactions is in a RDBMS and the search data is in Elasticsearch, and there's some other data in a graph database, there's multiple APIs you have to work with. And that is the reality of a modern application. So all of this should be easier. So Spring Data is part of the uh, Spring ecosystem, currently managed by Pivotal. Um, it's moved up the stack in this organization, but it's still part of the same group. Pivotal is now part of the, um, the new merger with um, Dell and EDS, I think, that owns VMware. So 
indirectly Dell owns Spring. Um, Spring Data relies on the Spring framework, provides a set of common patterns for persisting data using existing libraries. It provides a repository interface, finder methods, support for query DSL, simplifies persistence and enables polyglot persistence. If you look at the whole community, there uh, is a long list of projects. Um, you're most likely to work with uh, JPA, but um, Mongo, Neo4j, Redis, HBase, Hadoop, Solar, Gemfire, there's a Spring Data REST provider, and then there's various community projects, OrientDB, uh, RDF, Couchbase, Elasticsearch, Cassandra, DynamoDB. And it's growing. So basically, how does it work? You have to configure Spring Data for the specific technology. So if you're already using um, you have already have a Spring application and you are using uh, a JPA. So you already have a configured entity manager. You just need to add a simple step to enable uh, Spring Data. Your entity, uh, your entity is still defined the same way it was before. So in the case of JPA, you will annotate it as an entity and you will annotate your properties appropriately and it doesn't touch uh, that side of it. You declare a repository interface and Spring Data provides an implementation behind that repository interface. And at first that <coughs> seems like magic. And then that repository interface, the implementation of that can be injected where you need it. So let's look at more detail. So the to enable Spring Data, you have an entity manager as normal, an example in JPA's case. And if you have an XML-based configuration, you will add this that says, I have JPA repositories and they're in this package. Or you add uh, annotation to your Java configuration that says enable JPA repositories in that package. Here's an example of the entity. I removed the getters and setters just so that you can read the code. Here's the interesting stuff. So we declare a repository and we say that this repository extends CRUD repository. CRUD repository is a part of uh, Spring Data and it defines a class on which you can perform a save and a delete and a load and find all. And you say this is my entity and that is the type of the key. And that's all you have to do. If you want to use it, let's say I've got a, s a service implementation and I'm wiring in my repository and I say save the user. Spring Data provides the implementation that interacts with the entity manager to save uh, uh, the user object. But here's the powerful stuff. I now say I want to have a method to find by gender as an example and this is going to return a list of user I don't have to implement the query because what spring does is it it analyzes that method name and it parses it and it builds up a predicate so a predicate is a tree that um, any uh, for example, if, you, if you've dumped your Hibernate um, logs, you would see that it actually builds up this whole tree that represents the query um, after it scanned the query or parsed the query. 
before it generates the sequel. That tree is one big predicate. So that same predicate is generated here from that method. And the method says find by gender. So in this case it says there's an attribute named gender. So when the initialization happens, the library looks at the entity, and if it doesn't see an attribute or a property named gender, it's going to throw an exception because that method's invalid. Then you provide a parameter that represents the data, and that's all you have to do. Here's an example. I can say find by date of birth between. So the between after the attribute says there's going to be two parameters and you are going to use it to create a between query and in, in your where clause. Here's some other examples. Find by name, order by date of birth descending. Or find by name and gender. Here's some examples of the tokens that you can use. It's and, or, is, equals, less than, less than, equal, greater than, and a whole long list that you just write a method with that name and when you call it, that predicate that was created on initialization gets used to create a query to the database. So that query is then specific to the technology and it does the work. If you want to provide your own, you can annotate at query and then you provide a technology specific query string. So obviously in this case, this will only work with JPA. If you are using Mongo, then you will have to provide a Mongo query, which is a weird looking JSON string. So in this case, the implementation will substitute the predicate for this query because you've provided the query. Query DSL is a separate project you may have encountered. And this project allows you to you add an annotation to your entity that says, I want to do query DSL queries on this entity. And the uh, annotation processor, which you set up in your uh, project, runs as part of your compile, and it creates a new collection of classes. So the classes are named after your entity, but there's a queue in the front of the name, queue user. And that, enti that class has got static members that match the member names of the real class. So in this case, for example, if you do a static import on queue user, there's something called user which represents this class and it has a static member called gender which represents that property and you can use it in this way to, s to create a, 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 a bolder type query so you can say user.gender equals m or find all user.fullname.like so you can dynamically create your queries, but in a type safe way, because all of this is created based on those uh, classes. You can do paging and sorting. So you previously saw the CRUD repository. You can extend paging and sorting repository, which extends CRUD repository, and it adds the ability to do this. You can call that find all and you can supply a query. Oops, there's a syntax error. And you can add a pageable. And pageable says, I want to get a page back, not a list or a iterable or a stream, but a page. 
because there could be millions of rows and I'm not going to interact with them all. I'm working a page at a time. So this is great for um, to use in conjunction with a data table uh, that can page. And you can get the page and you can render uh, the page and then you say next and it'll go to the next page or you can say go to number 20 and it'll go to page 20 based on what you initially set up. So if you've ever tried to roll this yourself, you would know the value of, of, of this simple piece of code. So the pageable object comes from your user interface. This thing that you store in your session is much smaller because it only has the data for one page, but it can still interact with the, um, with the backing database. And you can also add a sort to the request so that, and you can change that uh, uh, dynamically. You can also set it so that it returns a slice. The slices, you can only jump to the next slice. You can't go, you can't go back. But that's useful if you're in an application where um, you know you're doing huge amounts of data, but you want to pull hundreds at a time and maybe put them on a queue and continue from there. So some more notes. There's shared code for multiple technologies like Mongo, JPA, Neo4j. The entity mapping is specific to the technology. So this is one thing that they add. For example, for MongoDB, they add a set of um, annotations that facilitate an entity mapping of an object to the underlying JSON. A common repository methods can be implemented. So in this case, if you want to add a new kind of behavior, you can extend the common repository and you can add that behavior and easily extend the whole environment. It's not hidden somewhere. If you're working with a plain, for example, entity manager in JPA, you're limited to doing what it can do. But if you wanted to do new kinds of things in a common way, you have to put this whole layer on top of it. And as I just showed you, the paging and sorting support. What I want to do is just show you some of the code. I have a, um, this project is um, on GitHub. Um, the URL is on the slides, and it has two sub-projects. One shows just the plain um, uh, Spring Data, and the second one has the um, Query DSL. Let me just change this resolution to something that you can see. Uh, configuration. This is a running as a standalone application with unit test. So um, it's pulling properties out of a property file to do things that if you're living in a container, they would be taken care of elsewhere. But eventually, you are interested in a data source. That's standard spring. That data source is used by the entity manager over here and this thing is setting up Hibernate underneath, and I actually provide it for different kinds of, of databases. I'm using um, H2 internally because that allows me to run the test without having to connect to a deployed server. In the case of my Mongo example, I'm setting up something called fake Mongo which is a library that's very useful because once again I can test Mongo interactions without having a Mongo database. But that setup is very different from the JPA one. Now if you look at this test code, this test code is the same for all the technologies. Here's a simple example. I have an audit service that's saving an audit entry. This thing is 
is um, uh, using it in conjunction with bean validation. And if you look at this code, you can see I'm creating an object. I'm adding entries to um, uh, um, audit info to an entry, and eventually I'm saving that. And that's the piece of, of code that's doing the hard work. That piece of code, we go there quickly, go to the implementation. You can see that it's saying repository saved. Here's an example of a query to find audit type, audit by audit type and audit time between order by order time descending. And I'm giving it a type start and the end date. And that will generate very different queries on JPA and Mongo. You can run it and you can look at the um, uh, uh, what's produced in the logs and you can see um, the underlying differences but your code's the same. So if you want to do this thing, uh, ThoughtWorks has a, I don't know if it's still part of their mantra, but it was uh, Mongo first. So you can actually start your development on Mongo, and then you can switch to, to JPA um, if you need to, or do something else. Maybe you find that the graph database is better. But if you're using Spring Data, that difference is much smaller. In this project, I've done some, a few silly things to try and make it so that my entities can persist on both uh, JPA and uh, Mongo. And um, that's this little bit. So I'm using strings as IDs, and I'm using the system UUID generator from Hibernate. The reason for that is that in Mongo, you can either have a string or you need a big decimal as your ID. But in JPA, you can't use big decimal as your ID because it says, uh -uh, uh, I don't know how to increment this thing or a big integer. So um, this is not necessarily a real world example, but it's something that I did to make this work. So. Go and find this project, download it, play with it, comment on it, and, um, and give this a go. It'll make a lot of headaches um, go away. The nice thing about Spring is it doesn't hide the entity manager or the underlying Mongo template. You can still get to them and you can still do specific things. But those simple things that meant a lot of the same repetitive work, they go away. And if you have any questions, you can fire them off at our um, session later on. Make a note, and um, or look me up uh, when I'm topping up on my coffee. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>